once you have all of your purchase order options completed, you're now ready to enter purchase orders. To do so, you would go to the purchase order module under the main folder and go to your task of purchase order entry. When you're in purchase order entry, you can do a lookup to actually see all of your existing purchase orders. Prior to entering a purchase order number, you'll notice over on the right hand side you have a defaults button that's available. If you click on your defaults button, this will allow you to set a defaulting order date, a defaulting order type, required date, ship to address, warehouse, do you want the purchase order to print. You can also define a ship via or a note in your freight on board. What this will allow you to do is if you're entering multiple purchase orders, these will always be your default settings. So it just helps you assist you in data entry just to make it go a little bit quicker if these are some of the standard defaults that you need for today's entries. Back over to my order number. Again, I can select an order number from my lookup. I can also use my F2 for that lookup. Or I can go to my next order number. So by creating a new order, I'm going to define what's the next system purchase order number to be defaulted. We have the option of overriding our order date. Again, everything that's on our screen currently came from our default setup. So we're going to create an order for our date of May 31st, and it's going to be a standard order. In the drop down, you have a few different types of orders that you can process. You can process a drop ship order, a master order, a repeating order, or a material requisition. In our setup here, we're just going to go ahead and process a standard order. You'll also note when you enter a standard order, you can link it back to a master order or a repeating order. So if you do find that you're purchasing something very similar over and over again from the same vendor, you could create it initially as a repeating order, and it's basically a way that you can copy from. But again, in our process here, we're going to just do a standard order. You then need to define a vendor. So I can either enter my vendor number or do a lookup on my vendor number. And we're going to go ahead and use Stevens Supply. I'm just going to double click on that. Now you'll notice once I've selected my vendor, it's going to populate additional information on my purchase order. Something else that has appeared when I've selected the vendor is I have my memo. We have memos available at the vendor level. We also have memos available at the purchase order level if we decide to attach notes regarding the purchase orders or if we want to view notes regarding our vendor. Your standard order status will default as new. Once you print your order, it will be an open status. Your required date is ultimately your expected delivery date. So in this example, the default will always default to your order date, but maybe I want to change this date because I know that I'm not expecting to actually receive this product for another week or so. So I can just click on my calendar and maybe I'm going to make this out to June and say I'm not actually expecting for it to arrive until June 10th. Setting a required date and or expected date will be helpful on some of your reportings in purchase order because now I can easily send a report out to shipping so they know when the expectation is for these products as well as sales orders, people doing sales order entry, they'll also be able to easily define when these fulfillments will be made on these purchase orders. I also have a default here if it was a 1099 situation regarding my vendor. And I also have sales tax. If you have sales tax turned on, the schedule will default from your vendor. You can also define if this particular purchase order is going to be reflected of use tax. In your purchase address, if you had any purchase addresses set up, you can do a look up here and you could actually define a location list. Now, if you want to set up a brand new one on the fly, you can easily do that as well as long as you have rights to do so. So the purchase address would be the defaulting purchase address coming from your vendor setup. The ship to address is where are we expecting this product to get shipped to. So if I do a look up on my ship to, these are our internal warehouse locations. So maybe in this example, I'm going to go ahead and I want this product to actually get shipped to our Western warehouse. Our terms codes defaults from our vendor but can be overwritten. We can also define how this product is to be shipped. So again, I can do a look up in my ship via, and maybe I'm actually going to be expe expecting this shipment to come in UPS second day air. I have notes for my freight on board, and I also have my defaulting warehouse. Now my defaulting warehouse is coming from my initial setups. However, I can override this. So since I know that I'm gonna be shipping to my Western warehouse, 
I'm going to make my default my Western Warehouse, which is warehouse number two. This again is going to be a default on all of my line items, so when these products get received, they will actually be going into warehouse two. The default of 00, zero if I didn't change it here, would have to be overwritten at the line item. You have the option to define a com confirm to information, email information, phone fax. You can also in attach an internal comment as needed. You can place this purchase order on hold, that way nobody could actually receive upon it if you had problems with this order later on. And you also have it identified here to be able to print. So once we're completed, we'll be able to print that purchase order. I'm gonna now go over to our lines tab. Excuse me, I'm now gonna go over to our addresses tab. On the address tab is where it defines the purchase location. And again, this is the default from the vendor. We did not have a location defined, but it brought in the vendor information from our vendor setups. My ship to address information defaulted based on me selecting that WST on the main page. But again, I can still override any of this information at this time. Now over on my lines tab, this is where I'm actually going to identify the items that I want to purchase from this vendor. This little flashlight is an alias item, so I can actually do a lookup on my inventoried alias item listings. If I go directly into the grid section, I have the opportunity to select, do a lookup here, and get my inventory listing. So if I'm using inventory, I can easily select an inventory item. I'm going to go ahead and pick our printer stand. And then I can define how much of this item I want to purchase. So maybe I want to purchase 10, or say 10 of these items. Now my cost is being populated based on my cost hierarchy. So if this item happened to be standard cost, it's also going to look to see if I have a vendor price schedule set up. Um, it's going to go through those different hierarchies in order to come up with that unit cost. If this unit cost was incorrect, I can override it at this time. You'll also notice that this particular unit cost has a three decimal place for unit cost, whereas my extension is only a two decimal place. Those settings are set up in your common information, and that's how that is being defined based on those setups. Once you've entered some line information, you'll also notice that you have a text window. This is my extended item description window. I can open this up, and if this description continued on, I'd be able to see that full extended description on this particular item. In my primary grid here, I can then see my extension, and if I scroll over, I also have a comment field. Now one thing about my primary grid is I have just those few pieces of information that I can use for data entry. In my secondary grid, this is where I have my description, my defaulting warehouse, my unit of measure, and so on. If there was information in my secondary grid that I would prefer to see in my primary grid and vice versa, you can easily move those around. So for example, if I didn't want to see this comment section, I could grab the comment just by left-clicking my mouse, dragging, and dropping it down into my secondary grid. So now for data entry purposes, I only have to enter item and ordered amount, my unit cost should populate as well as my extension, and I can simply tab through or enter through those fields. Maybe I want to see the warehouse on my primary grid. I can then grab my warehouse again just by holding the left click of my mouse and maybe drop it right after item code in order to be able to see that in my primary grid. So it just makes your data entry a little bit easier. Any changes that you make between your primary grid and your secondary grid are user specific. So your screen may look a little bit different than someone else's if you start predefining your primary grids and secondary grids. If you had entered information on a line item that you necessarily maybe you didn't want this line item, you can easily delete it with your options up above. You can also insert a row. So if you prefer things to be in a specific order, you could insert a row. And you can also reset a row to clear it out. I'm going to just go down to my second item. Now in this item, maybe I want to purchase a miscellaneous item. I can easily enter the forward slash and do an F2 lookup. And then I'm going to get that miscellaneous item list of things that I can actually purchase on a purchase order. So maybe I need to purchase some cables from this particular vendor. 
So that's where I get my miscellaneous item code, which is a non-inventory code. And so maybe for cables, I just need to purchase nine cables. Now that defaulting unit cost is coming from the miscellaneous item setup, but again, this can be overridden. On my next line item, maybe I want to add a comment. So I again, I can do a miscellaneous lookup, and I have some predefined comments. But maybe I don't want to use one of the ones that are existing. This is going to be a one-time comment. I can just pick the one that's a letter C. By selecting the one that's a letter C, I then can go over to my comment and type in whatever comment information that I want. So now I'll have those three line items appearing on my purchase order. So once I've reviewed them, maybe I've reviewed things also in my secondary grid, just to make sure that I'm happy with that, make sure that I don't have things set to landed costs that don't belong. I can easily now take a look at my totals. So I'm going to jump over to my totals section. And under the totals, I have my non-taxable purchases populated. I could also define a freight amount here. And again, that freight posting is going to be based on the GL account in my setups. And I have my order balance total. If I was dealing with taxes, I would also have some tax detail information. So I would see all the different tax codes and how that was broken out if my vendor was tax exempt and so forth. Something else, if I jump back over to my lines view, you actually have a new secondary view as well. So in addition to my primary grid and my secondary grid, I can actually move my secondary grid to the right hand side of the screen. It again allows me for additional ease of data entry. In the upper right hand corner, I have a change view function. When I click on that change view function, it then brings my secondary view over to the right hand side of my screen, which now gives me a little more real estate on my primary grid for data entry. I'm going to go over to my totals and I'm going to accept. I'm going to go in back and bring up that order number that we just entered. I'm going to find that at my bottom of my list. Another function that I have, I'm going to set my grid back to standard view. When I'm in the purchase order entry screen, is when I'm available, when I'm in the purchase order entry screen, is also a very quick way to print the purchase order. In the lower left hand corner, I have my quick print function. Now you can have multiple types of form codes. You may have a standard phone form code. Maybe your company has one that's called purchase order. Maybe you have one that's specific with a logo, maybe one that's not. In our setup, we're just using the standard form code, which we've defined as a marble layout. We have the option to print comments. We can print them partially, which will only print a short portion of our comments, or we can print our full comments, or maybe we don't want any of the comments to appear on our purchase order. I'm going to tell it to print full comments. We also have the option to print extended item descriptions. So when you have an extended item description, something that's longer than 30 characters in your description, you can turn on this feature, which will allow that full description to print. And I'm going to go ahead and just preview this particular order that we have entered. So I can see from this purchase order that I have a few items here. I have the first item that I had selected. I have my miscellaneous item. And then I have that comment that I entered on the third line. And again, this is just a standard mass form. Yours may be much more customized. But we can clearly see the unit costs, the amount, and we can verify our totals, less any prepayments and so forth. Now, if you were entering multiple purchase orders today and just wanted to print them all at one time, you could easily go to purchase order printing. By going to purchase order printing, that's now going to allow me to select multiple purchase orders. One thing to keep in mind is, is if you've already printed the purchase order like we just had, you want to hit your select button. By hitting your select button, it then makes all of your current open purchase orders available to be printed. So now I can go back into purchase order under my selection, and maybe I could do a range of purchase orders. What I could possibly do is maybe select all the purchase orders that I created today. Maybe I created from number 14 
through number 23, which would be three purchase orders. And again, when you're doing your purchase order printing at this level, you again have the option to do full comments and include extended descriptions if you have those. We're going to go ahead and preview this purchase order printing. And I'm still using my marble form. And now I have a total up at the top of one, two, three purchase orders. So again, if you're doing multiple purchase orders at any given time and you want to print them all at once, perform that function through purchase order printing. It will be much quicker than doing quick prints at the purchase order entry level.